Good afternoon and welcome to the CLEAR webinar series. This is the first presentation in our 2016 webinar series. Uh, today's talk is Living Shorelines in Connecticut, Design Considerations and Site Suitability. So if that's what you signed up for, you are in the right place. Um, we will have a full slate of webinars again this year as we have in years past. And the next one is coming up on April 5th. Uh, which I will be doing on the state of low impact development in Connecticut, policies, drivers, and barriers. And just a quickly, a little bit of background on CLEAR. For those of you who aren't familiar with, with us, CLEAR stands for the Center for Land Use Education and Research. And uh, we provide information, education, and assistance to communities, basically um, looking to balance growth and uh, natural resource protection. And within that sort of grand lofty mission, we focus on three main areas, land use and climate resilience, uh, water and water quality, and uh, geospatial technology, both through training and tools to uh, help communities in those other areas. So that's it for opening stuff. We have three uh, great speakers today talking about living shorelines. We have Jennifer O'Donnell from the Department of Marine Sciences here at UConn. She's going to kick things off and then turn it over to Jason Zilberman, who's been doing research on living shoreline suitability here in Connecticut. He's a master's student in our Department of Natural Resources and Environment uh, here within our college, the College of Ag. And uh, then we're gonna end with Jessica, Le Jessica LeClaire from Circa. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica, just give us, I mean, uh, to Jennifer, just give me a minute while we switch screens here. Um, historically, Coastal erosion problems, can you hear me? We can hear you now, yep, you just came in. Okay. Have been, have been solved um, using hard structures like uh, groins and seawalls, uh, bulkheads and breakwaters. But we are um, learning that um, the coastal and nearshore environment is very important. And by construction, by constructing a permanent barrier that separates the land from the sea, we are adversely impacting this habitat and the ecosystem services that it provides. So states are encouraging or sometimes even insisting that we now consider more uh, environmentally friendly um, solutions to coastal erosion problems. And these approaches go by various names, um, green infrastructure, uh, natural or nature-based features, or living shorelines. And so for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to call them living shorelines and not make any distinction between the different types. Now, living shorelines aren't a new idea. They've been constructed in the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries for over 20 years. But there's still a reluctance from coastal consultants to um, use these approaches because we don't have the codes and guidelines on how these um, living shorelines will perform in um, short-term events such as storms or over the long term dealing with um, issues like sea level rise or changes in available sediment. And um, and like, like sea walls, where we, we've got guides um, and they've been constructed for years. And if we want to build one, we have a pretty good idea of how we build one to withstand certain conditions. And so um, most of the work that I'm going to um, talk about here is based on a um, um, review of the literature of existing um, structures, both in the field and also laboratory um, research, trying to determine what um, aspects of living shoreline from other areas are suitable for the Connecticut shoreline. Oh. So in 2012, Connecticut passed an act um, which in, encourages us to use more feasible, less environment, environmentally damaging alternatives to include living shorelines. And so we are working on a, um, we have a working definition for living shorelines, which um, is fairly common to many different areas. NOAA has one, EPA, Virginia, um, Maryland. And the basics of all of these definitions is that a living shoreline is an erosion control uh, approach which restores, enhances, or maintains natural coastal processes. And so this is really important. So when we think about what a living shoreline is, say, compared to a traditional coastal erosion control structure, a living shoreline emphasizes 
the natural coastal processes. And, and its value is that it enhances or maintains these um, processes. So what are the benefits of the living shoreline? Well, obviously, they mitigate shoreline erosion while uh, maintaining ecosystem services. So in this picture here, this is a um, living shoreline marsh. And although I wish it was a lot better, if you, you look, there was significant waves, wind waves coming in. It was a very windy day. We're not talking storm waves. We're just talking frequent short-term event. And as soon as it hits this marsh vegetation, the waves are attenuated. If you look kind of into the lower right hand, you can see that there, there's, there's no waves here compared to here. And this is a pretty sparsely vegetated area, and it's effectively attenuating waves. Well, because we are attenuating these uh, frequent small events, this is allowing the, um, to protecting the shoreline and protecting the critical habitats that are there. Um, living shorelines, particularly uh, created or um, enhanced marshes, improve the water quality and they reduce storm water runoff, which is a big problem when we're looking at the health of our estuary. They decrease sediment transport. What happens is the marsh and dune vegetation traps and stabilizes sediment, and so it stays in the area it's in, rather being transported away during um, uh, storm events or even with um, daily um, sediment transport. Additionally, they have low initial and maintenance costs compared to traditional shorelines and shoreline access. This is something we don't talk about a lot, but if you build a seawall or a, a bulkhead, you're really separating yourself from the shoreline which you want to be near. It makes it difficult to access the shoreline. Um, it's hard to launch small boats like a kayak or canoe off a breakwater, uh, off a um, seawall. And frequently, by constructing a seawall, we lose the beach itself. So there's nowhere to walk along the shore. There's nowhere to lie in the sun. And it makes it difficult to swim. Um, living shorelines also encourage nesting and foraging areas. And a lot of people think they're aesthetically more attractive. Now, when I was reviewing this, I came across a statement that I hadn't considered, but once I thought about it, it made a lot of sense. Traditional structures are their most effective immediately upon completion. So you build a seawall, and that's the best it's going to be. Over time, it's going to deteriorate, and there's going to be scour in front of it, flanking along the sides. It's going to get overtopped. So with time, it's going to deteriorate. And this is pretty typical of bulkheads. It also happens with groins and so forth. But a living shoreline increases with the time it's in, um, it's in existence. The vegetation increases, it attracts more sediment, and it allows it to, to respond to storms and um, long-term changes such as sea level rise. So why can't we just use what we have found to work successfully in Maryland and Virginia? Well, the main reason is Connecticut, Long Island Sound is very different from most other places. We have a different geology, we have a different geography, we have different climates. And most interestingly, we have a lot of different types of shoreline. So if you think about New Jersey or North Carolina or Florida, you're looking at pretty long, straight, sandy beaches, not much variation. But when you think about Connecticut, we have a lot of different types of shorelines. So for instance, we've got wetlands and we've got beaches and dunes. But not only do we have beaches and dunes, we have different types of beaches. So this picture shows a barrier beach and behind it is a small embayment and a marsh area. This picture shows um, a pocket beach. And these are relatively stable beaches because they are kind of protected by headlands at each end. Um, we not only have sandy beaches, we have rocky or cobbled beaches. And then we have wet sand beaches. And, and when I say wet sand, I mean there is never a period where the sand dries out because it's all covered at the high tide. This beach here was initially had dry sand beach, and then with the construction of seawalls, storms, sea level rise, the high tide line now reaches the seawall, or in many cases is actually up on the seawall. So the, the beach is gone, it's now an intertidal zone. And we also have bluffs and rocky shorelines. So this is obviously 
a rocky bluff. Um, we also have eroded, well, softer bluffs. This one has vegetation, and there's a little bit of erosion down here at the toe, but it's a fairly stable bluff. Um, here's another vegetated bluff, but this has a, um, a seawall protecting the toe. And then if you can see this, there's construction going on up here at the bluff. And so they've decided to create an unpermitted revetment by just kind of tossing the rocks over the side. And over here, we have um, an unvegetated, highly erosive bluff. Now, there are two types of approaches to living shorelines, structural and um, non-structural. And the structural ones we refer to as hybrid approaches because they have non-structural and structural components. Now, for non-structural ap uh, approaches, we have bluff regrading and planting. If the bluff is too steep to maintain vegetation, we can regrade it to a more stable slope and apply vegetation, and thus stabilizing the slope, making it less um, erosive. Um, there's marsh creation or restoration, and beach nourishment and dune creation or restoration. But the thing to keep in mind is you have to select an approach that would work there in nature. You can't build a marsh in an environment that would never be able to naturally maintain a marsh. And you can't build a dune in an area that can't, would never have a dune. The other thing to keep in mind when we talk about dune restoration or even beach nourishment is that we can't think about the dunes along the um, Connecticut shoreline 20 feet high like we have in North Carolina or New Jersey because they have different coastal processes, different wave environments. They naturally develop larger dunes. While in Connecticut, our larger wave environment, our smaller wave environment, means we actually have smaller dunes. So we have to construct living shorelines that would be appropriate naturally. Now, there are hybrid approaches. This is where there's a structural component to provide additional protection. So this picture shows um, core logs that are used as toe protection for a vegetated bluff. Hmm. This shows um, marsh toe revetment and marsh sills. Now, these are kind of similar. Marsh toe revetment is up against the, the uh, leading edge of a marsh, and it protects the... the um, the vegetation behind it from wave action. A marsh sill, you can think about kind of like a little mini, mini uh, breakwater, which allows the vegetation to behind it to be protected from um, wave action. Now, these two examples actually show pretty large um, marsh toe revetments and marsh sills because this environment is um, exposed to a lot of very large boat wakes and also a lot of wind wave activity. So in a less extreme environment, you might have a very small sill, just rocks you could have um, a bunch of school kids place. There's also oyster reefs are talked about a lot. Um, these have been fairly successful in the Chesapeake Bay. There is um, a possibility these will be less successful along the um, Connecticut shoreline because of policy reasons. One is a lot of the um, shoreline where these would be appropriate are already leased to shell fishermen. Additionally, in Connecticut, we remove older oyster and other shellfish to um, reduce the possibility of devastating disease. And finally, there are wave attenuation devices. Now, this one shows a device called a reef ball, but most wave attenuation devices share similar components. They're just kind of different shapes. This is put out to provide protection to a reef, I mean to a marsh, but uh, they can also provide um, protection to a beach. They're like a breakwater, except that they have holes in them that allow the water to flow in. This also provides habitat for fish, for nesting and foraging. So, how effective are living shorelines? Well, when I was doing my research, I kept coming across this statement. Wave height was reduced by 50% within the first five meters of the marsh and 95% after crossing 30 meters of the marsh. But it was never referenced and nobody ever said how high the waves were and, and what actually was happening. And so this made me very curious about, really, what could a living shoreline do? And so, as I mentioned earlier, they can attenuate waves. They stabilize the shore. 
They also provide protection from storm surge and waves. Um, not only will the marsh provide kind of a storage area for surge and reduce the waves, but um, um, dunes and beaches can also reduce the effects of storm surge and waves. And lastly, they are um, able to respond to changes in sea level. So it becomes interesting. How do they work? What kind of protection do they provide? And how does the level of protection vary with environmental conditions? So let's, let's think about the last question. If we have a marsh, the amount of protection is likely to vary by how dense the vegetation is and whether the vegetation is a single species or it's a diverse um, vegetation. But it also depends on what the season is. If, if you've got vegetation with leaves and we're in the winter season, well, we're going to lose those leaves, so we're probably going to have less protection. And it even changes during a storm. So if a storm wave hits and the vegetation stems are broken down, well, that changes the level of protection. So it becomes a very complicated problem. But frequently, people find it hard to believe that sand dune <laughs> can provide protection. I mean, we've all built sand castles on the beach and a wave comes and it washes away. But the thing to keep in mind is a, a natural sand dune or a created sand dune is really a lot more than a pile of sand. It's actually built up over time and it's stabilized by vegetation. So if we look at this picture on the left, this is a um, beach beach huts and you can't you probably can't see it at least I can't see it right now there are people standing here and so about um, six feet of sand was eroded from below this the huts and additionally the the ladders or the um, staircases down from the huts have all been eroded away but right next to it so in the same conditions the same waves the same orientation you can see this um, dune yeah, granted, it did erode. This was taken immediately. This is like three days after Sandy. So you can see it eroded. But you can also see that it's still standing, that it still would provide protection behind it. Unlike what happened below here, where there's no protection. It just all washed onto the land. Now, this is about, I don't know, about maybe a thousand meters away from, nah, not that far. Maybe half that. Um, from here, same orientation. But you wouldn't know. This was taken the same day, three days after Sandy, and you couldn't even tell that this beach had experienced a major storm event. So there's a number of considerations um, when you're trying to decide what approach is um, applicable to your site. As I mentioned previously, you don't want to build a dune where you can't, where a dune wouldn't exist naturally, or a marsh in an area that can support a marsh. But there's a number of other considerations because living shorelines are, are, are site specific, as Jason will tell you in a few minutes when he discusses the decision support tool that he has developed to, to help people decide what is an appropriate site for a living shoreline. So the wave environment, are there big waves? Um, are there boat wakes? Um, I can't see this. Um, ice, um, how much? How often do you have ice? How much ice do you get? What kind of damage can you expect from it? The tidal range. I mean, even in Long Island Sound, we've got a significant variation in our tidal range from the eastern end to the western end of Long Island Sound. Surge. What surge are expected? The near shore bathymetry is very important. Does, the, um, does it slope gradually? Or do we have a very steep slope offshore. A steep slope will allow bigger waves to approach the shoreline while a gradual wave will break the waves as they approach. Um, shoreline change. How much erosion? Is it fairly stable? Is it slightly eroding? Or is it an area where we have a high level of erosion? Um, what's happening upland? You know, is it gradually sloping or do we have a steep eroding bluff? Shoreline width. You know, is it 200 feet wide or is it two feet wide? Um, and finally, the soil bearing capacity. If you're considering using a um, hybrid approach, will the soil be able to hold whatever structure you want to put on top of it? Some additional considerations, as I mentioned, what type of shore it is. Um, <coughs> are, there, are there coastal engineering structures there now? And if so, are they functioning? Um, do you want to remove them? Do you want to re um, restore them? Um, we also have to consider what's what's inshore of the 
um, the structure. Do we have things at risk? You know, is there a, a sewer line going right along the beach end, which would be disastrous if it was damaged during a storm, or is it, um, you know, a wide grassy area that if we get um, flooding, a bit of erosion, it's not going to matter. Um, boat traffic, once again, if you're near a marina, boat wakes are actually different than waves caused by wind or waves, and so they affect the shoreline slightly differently. Shoreline geometry, you know, I mentioned earlier that a uh, um, pocket beach is a very stable beach, you know, but this, this makes a difference. Do you have a long straight beach? Do you have a, a varied beach, pocket beach? Um, we also have to consider the near shore um, conditions. Do you have aquatic vegetation? Do you have self sh shellfish? This will also make some decisions on, on what kind of um, approach is suitable. And what's happening at the um, adjacent properties? You know, do they have do they have traditional structures? Are they eroding? Are they interested in in um, building one big um, living shoreline? A larger project is will be more successful than a smaller one, although smaller ones can also be successful. Site accessibility. How are you going to build whatever you're going to be build? Are you going to go over land, or are you going to have to um, access the site by water? And finally, shoreline usage. What do you want to do there? You know, and, and so do you want to walk, fish, boat, whatever? You've got to consider how what you select is going to affect your ability to use, it, use the site. And finally, I think we have to get away from the thought that armored shorelines are guaranteed protection. So you can see in this picture, this is a big seawall. And I've enlarged it here, so you can see these two people here, just to kind of give you a scale of what happened here. This was caused by Sandy. The seawall, which was in good condition, was overtopped, whoops, and um, caused um, scour behind it. The wall was no longer supported, and it collapsed. So we have catastrophic damage. Now, interestingly, this is right next to that vegetated dune I showed you. So potentially, these people would have been better off with a dune that probably would have experienced some erosion than they were with their seawall. Um, so there's more information about um, what I uh, learned in reviewing the existing literature um, in this reference that's here. It's, I, it's in press. It should come out shortly. I just don't have the... Um, the issue number quite yet. And now Jason's going to talk to you about a decision support model that he has developed to help identify um, areas that are suitable for living shoreline and which what uh, approach would be useful at each site. Hi, my name is Jason Zorman. I'm a master's student in the Department of Natural Resources at UConn. And today I'm going to talk about living shoreline site suitability in Connecticut. So. Information limitations has been identified as a challenge according to the Virginia Institute of Marine Science Center for Coastal Resources Management. And this includes uh, three main aspects. The first is what is a living shoreline? So Jennifer just talked about uh, the definitions, some of the design, uh, some of the research. And this includes other aspects like policy and permitting. Another question is where are there examples of living shorelines? Uh, you see on the right, there's a picture of reef balls at Stratford Point, one of the earliest examples of living shorelines in Connecticut. But the problem I set out to address is where do living shorelines work? Uh, this is an important question of decision makers and waterfront property owners figuring out how they can protect their property. So where do living shorelines work? Well, VIM CCRM has developed two decision support tools to answer this question. Uh, the first is in the form of decision trees. So these are flow charts for property owners to figure out what can be done to prevent erosion, mitigate erosion. So it'll ask questions like, is there erosion on the property? Uh, is the shoreline forested? Uh, what is the height of the bank? Uh, is there marsh or beach present? And then based on the response, it will tell you what can be done to protect your property, whether it's a soft, non-structural living shoreline design option or a hybrid living shoreline. And then another decision support tool is the shoreline management model, which is a geospatial model that takes the decision trees and represents the living shoreline output spatially. 
And then there's been similar studies that have um, done living shoreline site suitability. And these, these reports have been influential in creating the living shoreline site suitability model for Connecticut. Uh, Berman and Renicki's 2008 suitability model for Worcester County, Maryland, and then Cary's 2013 site suitability model for North Carolina. So the living shoreline site suitability tool is a screening tool. It's the first step in considering shoreline protection, erosion control alternatives to shoreline hardening in Connecticut. It is a geospatial roster-based binary model. So roster is the data format. Um, it can be a geo TIFF or an image that's geo-referenced. Uh, roster is made up of rows and columns of pixels. In this case, the output to my site suitability model is three foot spatial resolution, and the outputs are binary. So it's either suitable for a living shoreline or it is not at the specific location. So it uses coastal conditions and site characteristics to determine coastline suitable for various living shoreline methods. And this is based on threshold values established in the literature, based on Miller's 2015 living shoreline engineering guidelines, and based on uh, previous living shoreline site suitability studies. I used ArcGIS 10.2 for the study, and I used uh, Python to automate some of the processing. And then the overall theme here is that suitability is a function of wave energy in presence of vegetation. So I'll explain what that means later on. The study area is from Greenwich to Stonington, the 24 coastal communities within Connecticut. And more specifically, the study area is a 300 foot buffer of each town's boundary adjacent to Long Island Sound. I have four objectives for the study. The first is automate geoprocessing workflows to model site suitability. And then once I was comfortable um, with a developing sound methodology, uh, determine how much of the Connecticut shoreline as defined by the study is suitable for soft and hybrid living shoreline design options. And then the overall goal is to help expand and encourage the use of living shoreline treatments in Connecticut through the development of a decision support tool, and then define model limitations and determine which data are needed to refine the analysis further. There's five data layers to the site suitability model. The first is fetch. Uh, fetch is the distance that wind can travel over open water. Um, I use the USGS WindFetch ARC tool, and this requires a land cover roster that specifies the extent of the study area to produce fetch, and then it also requires a text file for wind information. So I, I produced a 10-year climatology of, from wind data from the Long Island Sound Central buoy. Uh, bathymetry or underwater topography, this data came from the NOAA one meter T-sheets, which is a contour data set. And then I appended into that contour data set the NOAA cusp polyline, which is represents the shoreline. Um, once I did that, I interpolated the contour data set to a continuous grid at three foot spatial resolution, which rep represented the near shore bathymetry for Long Island Sound. Uh, Beach was created via on-screen digitizing. I completed this using 2012 ortho imagery in the mean high water line from the cost data set. And basically I just pulled up the imagery on the, the computer screen and just traced along to create a beach layer. And then Marsh came from the 2009 um, Mark Hoover's master's thesis, which classified Connecticut wetlands using e-cognition software. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with e-cognition software, it's a pretty robust supervised classification method uh, it's based on user-defined uh, rules. And in this case, Mark used uh, high-resolution LIDAR data to classify um, different classes of marsh, like low marsh, high marsh, phragmites, ivofrutescens. But in the case of living shoreline site suitability, um, all marsh has the ability to attenuate wave energy. So I aggregated the four classes of marsh from this study to simply one class that I just called wetlands at a three foot spatial resolution. And then erosion data came from the Connecticut Sea Grant Clear Deep Connecticut Shoreline Change Analysis of 2014. This report looked at long-term and short-term trends in erosion and accretion along the Connecticut shoreline. I used the short-term erosion 
for this particular study because short-term erosion is more indicative of storm-induced erosion. The model outputs both soft and hybrid living shoreline design options. Uh, the first soft option is beach enhancement. This includes sites with potential for beach nourishment and dune restoration. Uh, marsh enhancement includes sites with potential for planting of vegetation, marsh restoration, uh, or marsh creation. And then hybrid designs, which are designed for uh, more moderate to higher wave energies, include sites with potential for marsh with man-made structure to protect the marsh habitat. So this can include shoreline parallel structures like sills and riprap, as well as uh, shoreline perpendicular structures such as groins. And then the final output is offshore breakwaters. So this includes sites with potential for a breakwater structure to protect beach habitat. So this can include traditional breakwater structures as well as living breakwaters, like the reef ball site at Stratford Point, Connecticut. And it's important to note that it's only considered a living shoreline method if it provides habitat. Um, if the main purpose is level of protection and the project doesn't necessarily consider um, the trade-off in ecosystem services, it might not be considered a living shoreline. Here's the overall methodology for producing site suitability. So on the left, you'll see the five data layers. These five data layers were uh, pre-processed to three-foot spatial resolution, um, produced two rosters. Once I did that, I clipped to the coastal town, uh, one of the 24 towns within Connecticut. Uh, they were processed and then they were classified based on threshold values established in the literature. And once reclassified, they were overlaid to produce site suitability, one of the four living shoreline outputs, uh, soft and hybrid. So here are those guidelines to reclassify the living shoreline layers. Um, in terms of site suitability, one would indicate areas that are most suitable and zero is unsuitable. Um, 0.7 and 0.3 in the fetch and erosion layers are areas that indicate the level of suitability. So moderate 0.7, uh, it's more suitable, high 0.3, less suitable. Um, for example, fetch. If fetch is from zero to one miles, then that indicates that it is low wave energy. So that would receive a value of one, meaning it's more suitable for a living shoreline design option. Moderate one to five receives a value of 0.7. Uh, it's more suitable than 0.3 and zero. Um, so fetch and erosion are considered factors, scale values, and then bathymetry, marsh, and beach are constraints. Um, they're binary, they're, they're ones and zeros. So marsh and beach, if marsh and beach are present, it receives a value of one. If it's absent, it receives a value of zero. And this is based on the Living Shoreline Engineering Guidelines from Miller's 2015 report, as well as threshold values established in the earlier site suitability models. So this might be hard to see, but this just helps explain that all the reclassified layers were pulled from their respective location and put into one folder. And then once in that specific workplace, the calculations were made to produce site suitability for each of the four outputs. Um, this, this slide shows what it looks like uh, pixel by pixel on the rasters. So you can see that there's constraints and then there's factors. Constraints are binary, uh, ones and zeros. So for bathymetry, if it's shallow, it receives a value of one. If it isn't, it receives a value of zero. Uh, marsh, if it's present, it receives a value of one. If it's absent, it sees a value of zero. So these constraints are multiplied together to produce combined constraints. And then the factors are standardized by, by a weight. In this case, they're both multiplied by 0.5, which means that it's unweighted. All, all layers in this model are uh, equally weighted, equally important. So it, it's multiplied by 0.5 standardized, then these Factors are added together to produce combined factors. Once you have that, they're multiplied by the constraints to produce uh, suitability. And going one step further, pulling out the ones and zeros so that the results are binary. It's either suitable for marsh enhancement 
or it isn't suitable. So I'm just going to talk about um, Marsh Enhancement for Old Sabre, Connecticut, which was one of the crest sites for the grant. So on the left, this is just a screenshot of the ArcMap software. And you can see that uh, this green draped over 2012 ortho imagery is all the wetlands over Old Saybrook. And then on the right is the reclassified wetlands. So you can see this, this gray 300 foot buffer uh, that receives a value of zero. And wh wherever there's wetlands, it receives a value of one, that, that green ribbon. Similar with bathymetry, it's a contour data set that had to be interpolated along the coastline. And then this is what the final reclassified output looks like. So one equals green, it's suitable. The red is unsuitable and receives a value of zero. Uh, if you notice these two locations here, um, up in the Connecticut River, you see this red patch and that's caused by a marina. And then if you look down to Long Island Sound, you see another little red patch and that's due to a headlands area. Uh, this is what the output looks like from the USGS ArcGIS uh, fetch tool. And then similar, it had to be interpolated along the study area. And then this is scaled. So one is most suitable. That receives a value of, that, that's the green area, um, 0.7 moderate. It's the orange, uh, yellow, 0.3. Uh, low suitability, and then red receives a value of zero, it's unsuitable. And then this is what the erosion data looks like from the Connecticut shoreline change analysis. It's a point data set, and this had to be interpolated along the study area. So one is most suitable, and then there's a value of 0.7, so moderately suitable, and then a little bit of red. But that, that's an artifact from, from the interpolation. And then once reclassified, they're combined, they're overlaid together. And then this indicates areas that are suitable for marsh enhancement. So areas that are suitable for either marsh creation uh, or marsh restoration. And you'll notice that the main areas are within North and South Cove of Old Saybrook. So I did this for the three other outputs from my model and determined that there's significant potential for living shorelines in Old Saybrook. Nearly three quarters of the shoreline is suitable for one of these living shoreline methods. Um, marsh enhancement is a very popular option in the living shoreline site stability model. And once I was comfortable with this methodology, I repeated the process to generate results for all the towns. So I determined that overall 46% of the shoreline as defined by the study is suitable for one of the four geospatial living shoreline design outputs. Uh, as I said, marsh enhancement is a very popular option. Um, almost 22% of the coastline is suitable for marsh enhancement. And this, this model also picks up significant potential for hybrid design options like marsh with structures and offshore breakwaters. Uh, there's a few limitations that property owners should be aware of with this model. So first, it doesn't consider man-made influence on shoreline erosion. Um, for example, it wouldn't consider the effects of a seawall on an adjacent property. Um, doing so at the same scale of the study would uh, is challenging. So one size does not fit all. Um, it's very important to perform a site assessment to figure out what can be done to protect the property. Um, th this model is a screening tool, so it's a first step in locating sites that are suitable for living shorelines. Also, it's static. It doesn't take into account sea level rise, and it doesn't take into account uh, future, future coastal storms or the effects that it would have on uh, erosion or wave energy. And then data limitations, using the best data available. So how does this help a waterfront property owner to decide what they can do with their property? Well, I've developed an ArcGIS story map that uh, showcases results from the study. So you should be seeing the uh, story map for living shorelines. And this provides information, uh, an overview of living shorelines, uh, why they're important, um, some information on my tool specifically. Uh, if, if you go to the 
about tab you can learn more about living shorelines outside of connecticut um, more more information uh, general information about living shorelines as well as information about living shorelines within connecticut and then if you click on any of the tabs you'll see that it opens up with the legend on the right for the map So that red area is the study area for the study. Uh, it's a 300 foot buffer of the coastline. And then you see this little patch here, uh, potential for beach enhancement. So if you zoom in, you can see that these little patches right here are areas that are suitable for living shorelines. And you can figure out how this was created how the site suitability model works for each of the outputs, as well as C results for all the towns. So that website's located on the CLEAR website under the Research tab. Uh, there's a couple ways to access it, uh, s.ucon.edu slash living shorelines tool. And then also if you go to the CLEAR website and navigate to the research section, it will be under the living shorelines area. So in conclusion, this educates property owners and coastal decision makers about living shorelines in Connecticut, automated living shoreline site suitability, and quantified sites suitable for living shoreline designs, soft and hybrid along the Connecticut coasts. And then I, I learned a little bit about data limitations from this. Um, future considerations for a, a geospatial model is considering factors such as salinity, uh, SAV, as well as uh, wave conditions. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. We're gonna turn it back over to Jessica. Uh, but before we do, we do have one question for you. And I do encourage people to uh, remember to uh, type in questions in the question box on your control panel um, throughout. And we're gonna answer most of them at the end. Uh, but there's just uh, one question that I thought Jason could answer now. The question is, are the living shorelines layers available for download? They're not yet available for download. Um, so this research is part of my master's thesis, so I still have to defend it, and uh, it's not yet available for download. But maybe sometime in the future we'll be able to work that out. Okay, so now we're gonna turn it over to Jessica LeClaire. Jessica, I'm gonna make you the presenter. Excellent. All right, well, thanks for the introduction, Dave. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Jessica LeClaire, and I'm the program manager for CIRCA, which is the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. CERC is a partnership between, the, between UConn and the State of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And our mission here at the Institute is to incre increase the resilience and sustainability of vulnerable communities along Connecticut's coast and inland waterways to the growing impacts of climate change on the natural, built, and human environment. And we have a particular interest in living shorelines and how we may utilize them in the state in determining how they may enhance a property owner or community's resilience to climate change. So because of that, we partnered with Restore America's Estuaries to hold the first of its kind National Living Shorelines Conference entitled Living Shorelines, Sound Science, Innovative Approaches, Connected Community, Living Shorelines National Tech Transfer Meeting and Regional Workshops. All right, trying to advance the slide here. Okay. That worked. Okay, so the event was held December 1st and 2nd in Hartford, Connecticut, and drew about 300 participants from all across the country. Uh, we were sponsored by the US EPA, NOAA, Connecticut Deep, the North Carolina Coastal Federation, and Munich Ray. And it was a two-day event where the first day had a national focus, while the second day featured regional breakouts. And the regions that we were highlighted were the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, Gulf Coast, West Coast, and Great Lakes. And today I'm gonna present a very high-level overview of the event and end with a list of resources for you. We want to leave time today for questions for Jennifer and Jason as well. There we go. So as I mentioned, the first day of the conference had a national focus. The first session of the day was Science and Ecosystem Services, which was moderated by Dr. Jim O'Donnell, our Executive Director at CIRCA. And the panelists discussed the current state of understanding in the field. The key theme was that in the pilot projects around the country, practitioners are finding success in terms of both erosion control and habitat restoration. Additionally, speakers refer to the importance of conducting more pilot projects in order to determine what type of living shoreline performs the most optimally and under what specific conditions. 
Another key theme was the importance of taking a whole systems approach when establishing a living shoreline in order to better reflect natural habitat. An example given by Marilyn Lata of the California Coastal Conservancy would be to co-locate co eelgrass spreads and oyster reefs. The next session of day one focused on policy, permitting, and regulation issues surrounding living shorelines. Across speakers, it was made clear that challenges from permitting are major impediments to implementation of living shoreline projects. Often there are many permitting agencies at the local, state, and federal level that have varied requirements as well as varied timelines for response. In hopes to streamline at least federal permitting, panelist Bill Sapp of the Southern Environmental Law Center discussed the upcoming reauthorization of Nationwide Permit 13 by the Army Corps of Engineers. Currently, Nationwide Permit 13 is used for bank stabilization of bulkhead projects, excluding natural and nature-based approaches. Under the current reauthorization period, the public can submit comments to include living shorelines under Nationwide Permit 13, which might make it easier for applicants to receive living shoreline permits from the Army Corps, if, if that's what they comment on. Lastly, potential financial incentives for living shorelines were discussed. Bill Lesser of the Federal Emergency Management Agency discussed utilizing the Community Rating System, or CRS, as a means to incent living shorelines. The CRS is a voluntary program of the National Flood Insurance Program where municipalities can take steps to increase their floodplain management in order to achieve reduced flood insurance premiums for its citizens. Communities can receive credit in the CRS program for completing living shorelines projects. On day one, we also discussed outreach, education, and engagement. In order to facilitate the deployment of living shorelines practices, the presenters agreed that a diverse group of stakeholders must be engaged from scientists to property owners to engineers to even realtors. When communicating with stakeholders, a consistent message is important. And our own Juliana Barrett of CTC Grant noted that outreach specialists need to help stakeholders overcome the psychology of card structures to help people understand that a seawall is not foolproof and that other solutions like living shorelines should be considered. And Jennifer mentioned that today as well. Lastly, panelists noticed Panelists noted that engagement through volunteer opportunities is very effective. Oftentimes, the construction of a living shorelines project may benefit from additional hands, whether to plant, move earth, or remove invasive species. And through this action, the volunteers are exposed to the benefits of living shorelines projects. Day one wrapped up with the Valuation and Innovative Financing Panel. Speakers on the panel discussed potential funding opportunities for living shorelines projects. For example, Dan Meese of the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center presented on the potential to finance living shorelines projects through coupling projects with others that have dual benefits. He, his example was that more and more municipalities are coupling flood management with clean water management, which may create opportunities to finance living shorelines and other green infrastructure projects. Michael Curley of the Environmental Law Institute offered that the Clean Water Act state revolving funds may be excellent sources of low interest loans for living shorelines. Michael stated that the fund is currently worth about $55 billion and that assets that could be leveraged into perhaps $1 trillion for financing projects. He did note though that project managers would have to determine creative mechanisms to pay back these loans. As I mentioned earlier, day two of the event featured regional breakouts. And I'm gonna focus my comments today just on the Northeast regional breakout. Um, but each of the regions listed above had to answer several charge questions, and these were to help guide the discussion. Working groups were selected and met in the months leading up to the conference to develop regionally appropriate agendas that would answer these questions. I'm not going to read them, but we'll talk about them a little bit in the slides to come. But I want to let you know that a conference report is due out this spring, perhaps in the next month or two, and this, is, this report will outline all of day one and whatever happened in the regional breakouts in greater detail. So my comments for the Northeast will be brief. So when we were asked to identify the most significant barriers to living shorelines in the region, conference participants stated that there is a need for maintenance, design techniques and standards, professional training, regulatory and permitting, and performance data. In order to overcome these barriers, participants stated that for maintenance, maintenance considerations should be included in the planning and permitting process that design techniques and standards should be developed and shared within the Living Shorelines community, that professional training be offered to a diverse set of stakeholders, that regulatory and permitting agencies develop specific criteria qualifying Living Shorelines projects, and that case studies are performed throughout the region in order to generate performance data. 
And the regional breakout concluded with recommendations to move forward with living shorelines projects at different habitat types. The recommendations were diverse and very detailed, and I won't go into them much today at all, but I do recommend that you check out the conference proceedings report. And the habitats that we were that we discussed were beaches and dunes, salt marshes, shellfish reefs, and coastal beach engineering. And these habitats were identified by the regional working group prior to the event as important in the Northeast context. So that's it for me. I would like to just conclude by providing some additional sources of information. Um, as I've mentioned, there's a conference website that's up, and it does have presentations from both day one and day two. Um, the conference report is forthcoming, but you can find it on the conference website. And something that was demoed at the conference was the Living Shorelines Academy. This is an online resource that has a database of projects, literature, and even online training modules. And it's something that's going to be growing over time, so check up on that if you're interested. And additionally, Connecticut has state-specific information on Living Shorelines available through Connecticut Sea Grant and CERCA, so you can check out those websites if you're interested. That's it for me. I think we would be happy to take questions uh, from Jennifer, Jason, or I, if anyone has any. Great. Thanks, uh, Jessica and uh, Jason and Jennifer. So if you do have any questions for any member of the J team, you can type that into the question box that's on your control panel. We do have uh, quite a few questions that have come in uh, so far, and I will just go through those. Let's see. So the first one, I think this one's for Jason. Uh, the question is, was there any consideration of upland land use classifications in the living shoreline site suitability model? So th this is a future consideration for the model. Um, as I understand, um, as sea level rises, marsh needs to ret retreat landward. So it's important that the upland land use allows for marsh to retreat. But I, I didn't consider it in the model. Okay, and then the next question is, uh, will someone asked if we could note again the address of Jason's story map website. And um, you can find that in two places. Uh, one, if you go to s.ucon.edu slash living shorelines tool, um, it will bring you to that story map. The other thing you can do is if you go to the clear website, which is clear.ucon.edu, and click on, click on mapping and research, you can find it there as well. But I think the easiest way is probably the s.ucon.edu slash living shorelines tool. And we'll also um, post this in various places so you'll be able to find it. The next question um, is more of a comment. Uh, somebody said, participants should be aware that the nationwide permits do not apply in Connecticut or the rest of New England, having been replaced with state-specific general permits with very different applicability terms and conditions. I don't know if any of the panelists want to respond to that or confirm or deny that. Um, this is Jennifer. Yeah, I, I will confirm that. Um, each of the um, Army Corps of Engineers district offices can set up their own permitting. And um, some areas, for instance, the Baltimore um, district office is um, much more used to living shorelines, and so their permitting requirements are uh, less onerous. Um, they are similar in... Um, uh, time to permit it as uh, a hard structure, while other districts, for instance, the New England district is less familiar with living shorelines. And so um, there used to be a general permit for the New England district, but now there are state-specific uh, permits in New England. Um, it, it should be clear that the Army Corps of Engineers has done a, a large uh, natural nature based features report so they are moving in this direction it's just the different district offices are moving at a somewhat different pace thank you jennifer and then the next one um has anyone examined the potential to the potential durability of beach enhancement conducted on the individual property owner basis because of end loss effects beach nourishment is not usually an economically viable alternative on that scale Jennifer, that's maybe for you. <laughs> yeah, that's quite, that's quite <laughs> the question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a problem. If you, you do beach nourishment, there's a good chance that if you are in an area with um, high rates of sediment transport, that it can be transported out. And if you're, particularly if you are downdrift of something that stops the transport, say um, a, there are seawalls or groins or jetties or something, then nourishing your beach may also contribute to your neighbor's beach nourishment. Um, groins are um, a possibility to reduce the, the um, sand transported away from your property. Um, the other thing that is interesting is that if you uh, vegetate a dune, um, that may also contribute to vegetation on your neighbor's property. I have um, a client who um, vegetated his dune and it's so successful that um, it's now the dune is not only healthy on his property, but the dune is also healthy on his neighbor's property as well. So it kind of works both ways. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I think this one's for Jessica. Where can we get a copy of the proceedings from the December workshop with RAE? Sure. The conference proceedings will be up on the conference website, and I'll proceed or go to the previous slide, and you can see the website up there, and that's where they'll be posted. They should be out, I'm thinking, by April. But don't quote me on that. Is that the top link on that screen? It is. Okay. Yep, the one that's under conference website with presentations. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So the uh, next question, oh, this is another comment. Uh, the public notice for the revision of the Connecticut General Permits was published this week. So that just is a follow-up to the earlier comment. Okay, well, I don't, don't see any more coming in. Um, I think this is a great webinar, and I want to thank uh, Jason and Jennifer and Jessica for um, presenting today. And as I said, this webinar was recorded, and we will post a video recording of it on our website, clear.ucon.edu, and you can find it there hopefully within the next, uh, hopefully by the middle of next week, I should have it up. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you soon.